I'm going to call to order the Ichikawa Common Council uh, meeting on Monday, April 27th, 6 p.m. Uh, could we all um, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United of America. To the flag of the United States, under God, indivisible, with liberty, and justice for all. Clerk, roll call. District Councilwoman Monica Gonzalez. Present. Second District Councilman Lenny Francisco. Present. Third District Councilman Terrence Hill. Present. Fourth District Councilwoman Stacy Winfield. Fourth District Councilwoman Stacy Winfield. Stacy, you muted. Present. Sixth District Councilwoman Gilda Orange. Present. Council, Councilman at Large Dwayne Ransifer. Present. Councilman at Large Emiliano Perez. Present. Councilman at Large Kenneth Monroe. Present. Council President Robert Garcia. Present. Any minutes of the meeting, um, Clerk? Regular meeting Monday, February 10th, 2020, and public hearing and regular meeting Monday, March 9th, 2020. Is there a motion to um, accept those minutes? I make a motion to so move. Motion made by Kenneth Monroe, seconded by Councilman Hill. Any questions? Hearing no questions, roll call. Gonzalez. Yes. Franciski? Yes. Hill? Yes. Winfield? Winfield? Yes. yes. Orange? <clears throat> Orange? Her mic can't be muted. Gilda? Yeah, she was on. Here she's coming back on right now. She signal okay. might have dropped. Mm -hmm. is there now, Vivian. Orange. This is for the minutes, uh, passing the minutes from uh, February 10th and uh, March 9th, Gilda. Gilda, are you there? She's connecting. All right. Uh, Mr. President. Oh, hold on. We, we still. Oh, we still. Okay. We're in the meeting still. Okay. Gilda. There we go. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I hit the leave button. No, no problem. She just. Uh, there was a motion made and seconded. To, about passing the, the minutes on uh, Monday, February um, 10th, and also the public hearing on Monday, March 9th, and it's to you now. Be your vote. One more. Yeah. You said. She Gilda, said yes. You, okay. Ransifer? Yes. Perez? Abstain. Monroe? Yes. Garcia. Yes. Any communications from the mayor? No. Any communication from the I'm, department I'm, heads? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There are communications from the mayor. All right. Um, I just asked in advance. Just let the clerk know so the clerk uh, know in advance. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, this is um, Carla Morgan, Corporation Counsel for the city. And so there are a few things I want to discuss with you about. One is the city's uh, COVID-19 policy for employees. And then the other is uh, we've made an important addition to the health department. And Dr. Browning is going to introduce that person. Um, so regarding our policy, uh, the city has created and revised and will continue to revise um, a COVID-19 policy. It's a temporary update to the employee handbook. Um, 
And so what it does, it incorporates the new federal law, the FFCRA, which creates different categories of leave for people who either um, are positive for COVID-19, uh, may have had exposure to COVID-19 or getting tested, are uh, taking care of someone who's confirmed for a COVID-19 under quarantine order. Uh, it also sets a protocol for what the city does when we find out somebody has COVID-19 or they present with symptoms at work. Um, and uh, it mandates that, uh, well, we've given uh, PPE to all employees. We mandate that everybody wears a mask all the time. That's the default. The only time you uh, are excused from that is if you're working alone in a room and no one else is there. But, um, and then it sets out that if, if people refuse to follow it or, or it's not enforcing departments, uh, people can be disciplined for not wearing the PPE. But in, in, uh, to summarize it, um, people are entitled to leave. And if we document it properly, if people have COVID-related leave, um, then we may be able to get reimbursed by the federal government. So it's very important that we follow the protocols that are set forth in this policy. And, um, and so we can both take you know, the best care possible of our employees and the city might be able to see some reimbursement in the future for it. Um, and I don't know if there are questions specifically on that, but I also want to, um, you all know Dr. Browning, but I want to introduce Dr. Browning so he can move forward with the announcement he had. I, I have a I have a question before we move forward with Dr. Yeah. Browning. Okay. With Dr. Browning or for um No Morgan. for Carla. Okay. Okay. For Carla. Go ahead. Go ahead, Monica. So when do we have that in our packet? Did you have do we have that in our email? No, you don't have uh the policy in your packet or your email. We when did, when did, five, when did three, that come five, about? Well, we've been working on this really all month. It got formalized on the 23rd. Uh, so we'll gladly email it to you. Uh, but no, we didn't make the packet. So are you going to make sure that that we get it? Because, I mean, we'd like yeah. to look, I mean, I want to look over it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have it in the morning. You have it in the morning before noon tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Uh, I can tell you... Uh, I'll email you a copy tonight, but I prefer that we send the official copy from the mayor's office. Uh, uh, Councilman Lenny, you have a question for Carla? No, I was just itching my ear, that's all. Okay. No, <laughs> I'm going I'm go nine. Uh, oh, I'm fine. Councilwoman uh, Winfield, you got a question? Uh, yes. So we don't have it in our packet. Did you just read it all the way through? Cause... It's nine pages. Oh, Lord. Any other so, questions on? Um, yes. Stacy? Stacy? Oh. All right. Okay. So we can ready to approve this and we don't have it in no, writing. No. And I asked for an approval. Okay. Because you in one and out. On that. I'm sorry, uh, Councilman Guzman Gonzalez. I didn't hear you. Uh, no, I was just saying it's not approval. Just a communication, right? That, that's what you're. Right. So I'm. I'm here to tell you all that we formalize the policy, and uh, we'll get it to you in the morning. Okay. And I apologize that it was approved too late to make it to your package. Stacy, you got anything? Yeah. Yeah. Stacy, anything else, hmm? Stacy? No, I just heard. I just heard. So this this policy, the employees seeing this policy, are they are they aware of this policy? The department heads all have the policy, and the instruction was they had to immediately implement it and disseminate it to the employees. And then also I have to note that the FFCRA went to effect at the beginning of the month, but they didn't put the federal regulations in place until you know late. So. You know, as soon as they announced the law was passed by Congress, we started reviewing it. Then a couple weeks later, the guidance, the actual regulations that go with it, came out. So it's been, you know, we had we had a draft. Found out when the regulations came out, a lot of things were covered. And so it's it's changed a lot. The document has. And I think the key changing is our understanding of how the leave works, how reimbursement works. 
what the medical knowledge is about COVID and symptoms of people with no symptoms, you know, over a list of six additional symptoms that we have today. So we'll keep updating it to uh, match what the reality is. And again, we've been working very closely with Dr. Browning to make sure we're following the proper guidelines. So. Oh. Okay, well, can the employees, to verify that the employees are getting all the information, are you all sending something out for the employees to sign stating that they received the information? Because some of the information may have gotten out before, but all the employees were not told. So they can get a clear understanding. Can you make it in a, a, a way that the employees can sign for it so that you, they can't say they didn't receive that information? We can add that. We do that for the employee handbook. So yes, yeah, what we can do. We did that for the department heads when it went on to department heads. But to my knowledge, we didn't also add that extra uh, layer where the uh, employees have to be signed and have got that understand it and all that. Yeah, I'm just doing that so that you can make sure that each employee can say they did receive the information. So okay, that's that's doable. We just have to do that through human resources and I'll get to work on that. Thank you. All right, Hill? Yes, uh, Carla. This yeah. is a little different uh, question from what you were talking about. Have you discussed okay. with the mayor uh, about having a test site here in East Chicago? Oh, I'm yeah. Wait, so Dr. Next. Browning can speak to that because oh, Dr. Okay. Browning's been working very hard on that. Okay, good. Because that will... Uh, senior citizen asked me that and said they didn't have they don't have transportation to get over in gear and most of them don't want to go to gear you know because they were at the st timothy but i'll let dr brown speak on that thank you uh, uh, miss orange gilda uh yes i have a couple of questions for Carla. Uh, my, uh, my dog is one uh probably i'll talk me hold uh but uh can you still hear me Robert? yeah i can hear you we're lightning okay so um, I have a couple of questions for Carla, and one is um, how are you guys getting the information from the state as far as who is uh, positive, and maybe this is for Dr. Browning, I don't know, be quiet, Breeze, uh, because, I, you know, for the residents and employees, how are you guys getting notification that person is um, positive? Dr. Brown, can you address that question directly? Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me? I yes. Tell you, my screen went totally crazy. I can hear my everybody, but I can't see anybody. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's something, it seems like, is, is Steve doing something? Possibly? I don't know, but I can't get back to where I was. But I, I think it's Attorney Buscemi uh, has, has shared his screen. Oh, okay. So... Um, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit uh, complicated, but it's really kind of simple. If you are um, a resident in the state of Indiana, when you, when you get tested, you have to provide your demographic information, you know, the usual name, address, date of birth, social, contact information, phone, cell, what have you. Uh, when you get a test, there is a reporting law that says that any lab who processes any kind of a specimen and the result, what, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Yes. Okay. If, if there is a uh, test result that affects the public health, that lab result needs to be reported to the Indiana Department of Health. Once, once the Indiana Department of Health, in this case, receives notice that a resident in the state of Indiana has been tested positive, uh, it's reported to the health uh, to the health department in the jurisdiction where they live. As as some of you may know, there are only two cities. Uh, in the state that still have health departments, that's East Chicago and Gary. And we're both in the catchment area of Lake County. But if a citizen of the city of East Chicago tests positive, the, the state will report to the East Chicago Health Department um, 
that that person is positive. There's a, 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 tra a computerized tracking system called NDS, and that's how we receive that information uh, directly from the state. So there is a little bit of a lag time. If you get uh, have your test today, you might not get the results for somewhere between three and five, maybe longer days. And, uh, and then it takes a little bit, usually what, by the time the patient is notified of their test results, most, most uh, reference labs have also report, reported to the state. And then the state puts that data into their computer system and reports it to the health department where you live. So that's how we oh. receive the, that's that's how we officially receive positives. So Dr. Dr. Bronnie, okay. Dr. Bronnie, are you guys doing that uh tracing for the uh, virus? Yes, yes, and, and and that's the reason why the state has an NBS um, computerized system exactly for that reason for tracking and reporting. So, you know, I don't know if this is the time, but I'll bring it up because the only reason I'm, I'm on this uh, meeting, the Zoom meeting, is because of the resolution which suggests that the health department is not tracking. As of today, we have 114 positive cases in the city. As of Friday, there were 90. And the cases are slowly coming because people are just starting to get tested. I have no idea how many people in the city have been tested, but uh, approximately 40 to 50 of those positives have already had contact from our one part-time nurse in the health department. So we are tracking. It is going to be a very volume-heavy tracking system. And if, if for each positive, there's a whole worksheet of information that the nurse has to obtain and get that data. She's, she's asking for contacts, people who may have been exposed, that information is then put back into the computer system and sent to the state health department. We have been doing that since the day we got our very first positive. So, you know, I appreciate the fact that people are concerned about tracking, but that in fact is something that has been going on. The other thing that happens, and I would appreciate the council's support on this, is that when we call citizens to, to inform them that they've got a positive test, we're getting a lot of hangups. So out of the maybe 40 or 50 people so far that we're, we've actually made contact with, we've had, well, not out of that, but we've, in addition to that, we've had another 20 or so that have hung up on the nurse, refused to call back, um, very rude. And so they, in fact, are causing a public health issue because they are refusing to name their contacts and exposures, which can then allow uh, this virus to continue spreading in our community. So that's, that's a big issue. Um, the other thing that happens now, you know, because we are the city of East Chicago and we have, um, we have employees that uh, often come up positive. And most employees are in fact residents here in the city of East Chicago, but there are some who are not. The East Chicago Health Department will not necessarily receive a positive test if they are not a resident in the city of East Chicago. If they're a resident in the state, then they will receive, then that county where they live will receive that. If they happen to live in Gary, then the Gary Health Department would receive the positive that comes from the lab that goes to the state and then it would go to the local health department. What we're also required to do, and we are doing it, as employees of the city find that they've been tested and come out positive, 
they are obligated to give the uh, health department documentation of that positive test. Even though the reference labs are uh, mandated under reporting law to report that directly to the state of Indiana, they ask, the state health department asks uh, employers and, and others to report positive tests to, in fact, the local health department, and we turn it around and report it to the state. And then we, and that's when it comes back to us into the, in the computer system, and we begin that tracking and tracing. So, I just have one other question for you, Dr. Browning. Uh, what is the responsibility of the health department since you guys are not doing testing? What is the responsibility of the health department since a lot of, people, a lot of the kids don't have it? So what would be, your, what is the responsibility? Well, we have arranged uh, for testing to come to the East Chicago Health, uh, to the city of East Chicago. We tentatively, and, and, and don't shoot me, I am waiting for the final word from Dr. Box, who's the state uh, Depar uh, health department commissioner, and they're working out the details, but we should have testing in the city on, Mar uh, on May 4th and 5th, which is next week. As you know, they were in Gary last week and the week before, and they had other counties booked already. Uh, there's, a, there's an advanced team of people that come up from the state health department. They have to get the uh, uh, National Guard involved. It's, it's a big deal. And so all the details have to be in place. We have identified Central High School as that location uh, where the testing will be. There's good uh, inflow and outflow from the uh, school's campus. And they have, you know, the we've talked to school superintendent and uh, we have full cooperation there. And so it's just a matter of them probably by Wednesday, we'll have, the, have that date absolutely nailed down. But as of 5.30 this morning, Dr. Box, the state health commissioner has assured me that's the most likely date where they will come. If we get a big enough response they'll probably try to stay on. So we're going to uh, uh, do everything we can to put it out there so that our citizens can come and get tested. There are some guidelines that go with that, but uh, you know, this is the first big effort. As anybody that knows right now, uh, if you're watching TV, you know that testing is an issue. Uh, and the guidelines for doing that has varied from day one, there aren't enough tests uh, to go around, so they prioritize uh, people who live in nursing homes, or other group home living arrangements, healthcare workers, um, and then of course people who are positive. The next priority is essential workers. We've already set up in the city uh, a procedure so that our first responders, like police and firemen, have a prioritized uh, COVID testing system with the community health system. That means St. Catharines, uh, St. Mary's, and community hospital. This has already been set up for three and a half weeks. And any, any fireman or police officer or any member of that department having a COVID related issue. You've been exposed, you're having symptoms, you're caring for someone at home, you can call a hotline number, they'll walk you in and get you tested. So that's been in place for a while. I just have a comment, Dr. Browning. When you was talking about that patient, and I'm, I'm done after this uh, councilman, um, Garcia. But the thing of it is, is that it's hard because I know I went through that. They thought I had it. I tested negative. But then people be, treat you like you got to play it. It ain't just a virus. People don't want to be around you. Your family don't want to come visit you. People are scared. So I, I can imagine when you call people, they're not going to say nothing about trace. They don't want to call it. This is almost worse than the scenario of disease. People don't want that. And I, I understand that in my line of work, we often have to deliver uh, diagnoses and, and test results 
that people don't want to hear. And unfortunately, in our culture, there are a lot of stigma put on certain illnesses. Right or wrong, we can't necessarily change that. And this disease is, in fact, one just like that. Nobody can see it. And it's just like, oh, no, you got the virus. And, and you know, it, that's the way people handle it. Uh, I think that that will change with education. And again, I solicit the support of the council to educate people as well and try to change that. This is about survival. Because in this instance, ignorance will cause spread of this disease and we can die. You know, I've been, uh, three and a half weeks ago, I was on the WJLB radio station before they announced the, da the, the data regarding health disparities and the social determinants of health. I was on the, on the radio station talking about the Latino and black population here in the city and identifying us as a high risk group that if we get this disease like anything else, we tend to suffer more than other people. And sure enough, it's come true to form everywhere. African Americans and, and, and Hispanic patients are dying at a higher rate than everybody else. And you know, this is this is not new. Every disease that can happen and affect us affects us worse. And so we're stuck having to fight not only these cultural things that inhibit us from, from doing what we need to do to be healthier, but we got to deal with this virus that's not discriminating as to who it infects. Any more questions, Gilda? No, that's it. Okay. Um, uh, Dwayne, you got any questions, more... Dwayne? Hold on. Dwayne, you got any questions? Dwayne Rathaford. I did have a question, but they were actually answered, so. Okay. I had my hand up, but they were answered. Mm -hmm. Hey, Emilio, all right, let me just go through everybody. I'll come back to you. <laughs> okay. Emilio. JR. No questions. Uh, Kenny, you got any questions, Kenny? No, I'm good. What, I, yeah, I don't want to say what numbers do they say that we have in Chicago again that was positive? As of today, we, we have 114 positive cases. They, 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 send the, they send the data in every morning somewhere between 10 and 11. Okay, do we have a number that was tested in general? We, we have no way of knowing that because people are going lots of different places to test. If, you're neg if you are negative, that's not reportable to anybody except, okay. the, except the patient. That's the only one the, the lab is obligated to report it to other than the physician who ordered the test. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Monica, go ahead. Just a housekeeping issue. If you're not talking, please put it on mute because we hear, I'm hearing a lot of background and it's interrupting. But the other thing is, um, Dr. Browning, you, I'm sure you'll have all our support. My biggest thing is a lack of communication of what, you're, what is actually happening. And we can't tell our constituents in our district what's going on if we don't have the correct information or any information at all. And so if you get new guidelines, whatever you get new, I just ask that you email it to us or have it emailed to us so that we know and we can keep up to date because if we're getting information, I might hear from somebody, I'm like, well, I have no idea and I'm a council member. So I'm just asking you just to keep us informed of any new information that comes along and that could help us within our community. So the so the 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 statistics are every day they're on the website. No, and I'm not talking about the statistics. I'm just talking about policy. Stuff like that. Stuff new stuff that is going on. Anything new that happens. Anything just like what you're just telling us and I don't know how long you've known about what's coming in, you know, what what testing is coming in or anything like that, stuff like that. The statistics, I can I could see that on the CDC website and, and they're doing a good job. ECTV is doing a good job of putting stuff in, but anything that can help us and keep us 
informed and and uh, and I don't want to have to wait for the next meeting in order to get informed is what I'm saying. Well, let, let me say this and, and and I want to make sure that we're on the same page with this. Um, I'm not sure that I need to uh, give specific information about tracking for the very reasons you brought up about tracking who's positive, which people in specifics are not. No, responding. I'm not talking about specifics so, like that. I'm talking so about what, just policy. Anything you're telling. So, so what, poli saying, what policy well, are you speaking of? Because the well, health department helps helps the administration follow CDC guidelines. You know, I'm lending my professional uh, expertise there, but in terms of policy, we don't set policy for the city. And I guess I'm using the wrong word. Okay, okay. Any help me understand. Right. Any information, like you said, testing is coming. You said testing is coming to Chicago. Yeah, well, I just right. got confirmation on that this morning. And again, I'm waiting for the hard confirmation. They're trying to work out the details, but it looks like the fourth and the fifth. Okay, so any information, any new information, I just, my thing is I don't want to have to wait for the next council meeting in order to get that information. Not, okay. well, you know, anything new coming through, anything that has to do with our city, any, you know, anything that every, we're allowed to know. Okay, and, and, and for that reason, every day on the health department's website, that new, every new, any new data we receive, any information, there's tons of it there. We post every, every single day, day. Okay. every day, every day. Okay. Now, here's the other thing. I've been in that health department almost eight years, and I've gotten one, maybe two councilmen to come and visit me there. I have an open door policy. I'll answer any question to the best of my ability. So if you got questions or concerns, come see me, call me. Now I do have a, a full-time <laughs> job that works. I'm not always there, but I'm there every week. Call me. Can, can you put your number in, on a piece of paper? So we can have it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I can, I can give you my cell number. I'm, no problem. <laughs> it, it's, it's 219. Okay. Three one three four eight six seven. Now I'll answer you. It might not be right this second because I do telehealth from home while the clinic is shut down. Sure. So I'm talking to patients most of the day, but I get back to everybody eventually. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Now, Wednesday is the day that he devotes to the city, so he's more reachable on Wednesdays. Yeah, I'm there. So here's the other thing I want to say because I know you got to move on, and I don't want to be here. Uh, forever. I just want to let you know that today we on, onboarded a new uh, team member and we brought back Diana Garcia Burns as the director for the East Chicago Health Department. So she's going to be working in concert with myself, uh, the current manager of the health department, Arnita Fultz, and uh, with our team, and we're going to bring on more nurses within the next week or two. And uh, we're expanding uh, our staff so that we can do the things we need to do in the health department. So again, I'd like for you to welcome uh, uh, Diana. Uh, she's uh, a nurse practitioner. She was the director several years back in the department. She did a good job then, and she should do a great job now. Thank you. Monica, any more questions, Monica? Anybody else got any more questions? Well, I got a couple. I want to congratulate uh, them high and Diane. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I got a question, Dr. Browning. Um, yes. With uh, some of the people that got tested, because the results are taking four or five days, and they're coming back. Um, some of them, quite a few of them coming off back positive. Can um, can we just have them stay at home until they get the results instead of Quarantine. getting everybody else exposed to it? Well, it depends on, on the job, and the guidance is very clear about this. So, you know, this is a good question. 
Uh, for example, if you are a first responder and you have no symptoms, you're asymptomatic and you go for a test, you have to come back to work. There's, we, and we have safeguards put in place for all employees. Everyone is supposed to be wearing a mask. Now the masks that we wear every day are not to prevent you from getting any coronavirus, they're to prevent you from spreading coronavirus to the people and the environment around you. In addition to that, we got out the gate early with advising the employee, uh, uh, the, all the employees in the city to practice hand hygiene, uh, sanitizing their local work spaces, vehicles, and then they were provided with gloves and masks. And they're supposed to be wearing them the entire time they are working. So yeah, I, it might seem uh, logical or illogical that certain people would be asked to come back to work. It also boils down to the level, if you're talking about somebody who says they, the, 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 the history is that they were exposed to the virus, it still, it, so that requires that they report for work, their temperature is monitored and, and they are queried for symptoms. Every day they come to work. If someone gets sick on the job, develops symptoms, they should be sent home immediately. But if you have no symptoms, there's no guideline that says you have to be sent home to sit at home. And what we've had on a few occasions and it's not the end of the world, but people are sitting at home for two weeks and their test is negative. That does not compute. But Dr. Brown, to me, I'd rather fall on, on caution. I'd rather not nobody get, hold on. I'd rather have nobody get exposed. Um, a lot of people are walking around it with asymptomatic. Um, and they're, take and they're home, spreading. Give it, to, take it, give it to another person that has underlying health issue. But I'd rather fall on caution. If they're not sick, the results come back, they're not sick, that's great, and that's great for everybody. I'd rather pay somebody to make sure they're healthy and don't spread it to any other employees. And, and I, I can appreciate that, and if it were uh, my world and I made up the rules, that might be one of them. However, you got individuals who feel like they come under the category of an essential employee, and mm -hmm. they have the right to work until there's a diagnosis that proves that they should be quarantined. And so, you know, it, it, we live in a country where people have rights and your rights can sometimes feel like you're, they're intruding on other people's. But I get it with this virus. I absolutely do understand what you're saying. And there's, there's a distinction between people who are first responders, people who are otherwise called essential employees, and then others, people in the general community. So for sure, we wanna make sure that people who are first responders continue to come to work. Can you imagine if every first responder said, well, I was exposed, I talked to him the other day, and now he's positive, you get half of the first responder staff sitting at home for two weeks, and then the city is at peril. So you can't do that. And the CDC guidance is very clear. It, it delineates the level of risk, low risk, medium risk, high risk, based on the kind of situation and interaction that that person has had. On, and, and then in addition to that, you have people who are positive, but not necessarily did they receive that contact at work. So it's, it's complicated. This is a new virus and the rules will be changing. I guarantee you in a month, there'll be some different guidance. But as of today, the guidance says, and this is printed, if you are asymptomatic, and unfortunately, uh, 25 to 40% of the people who have no symptoms are still positive. That's an unfortunate thing about this virus. And, but you, 
You can't make somebody go home if they have no symptoms. So our safeguards are masks, temperature taking, query about symptoms. Are you having a cough, runny mm -hmm. nose, sore throat, trouble breathing, all of those things, intestinal, uh, diarrhea, any of that. And if they're not, they're allowed to work, but continue all the hygiene, hand washing, hand sanitizer, wearing a mask, the whole time they're at work. And that's what we, that's best practice. Yeah, I understand that. The mask is not 100%, it's just a surgical mask, it's not an N95 mask. So yes, and, a N and you're talking two different things, I explained yeah. that. Yeah. A surgical mask or any mouth covering is deemed to be adequate for preventing your germs from mm -hmm. spreading to people around you and the environment. Mm -hmm. Only an N95, that's properly fitted, by the way, Correct. will give you maximum protection from this virus in yeah. terms of res respiratory-wise. You could take the N95 off and touch a surface where the virus is and, and touch your face and still get it. Yeah. Well, you just answered my question. The surgical mask is not 100%. But, um, and it's so not it, intended to be, nor has yeah, anybody is, said that it is. Yeah, it is. You're, you're correct. So... Um, so is is a matter of a policy, city policy. If we ask this, the employee, if the employee gets tested, is for the city policy to decide if they stay home or not. Um, no, Dr. Brown. no, that's no, that's not accurate. So their doctor will order them quarantined or not quarantined, and okay. we follow that. Yeah, what well, I'm saying, but we could also just as the, to fall on the side of caution, we could say that also, can we? Well, the FFCRA, which is federal law, um, mm -hmm. gives people 80 hours and equivalent of two weeks work off for COVID-related mm -hmm. leave, and that's got to last them all year. So I don't want to get into too many hypotheticals, but like say, we've had people who stayed home who turned out to be negative and didn't immediately inform the city that they were negative. Well, if they burn through their two weeks, then what would they do if they find out next week that they're positive? Mm -hmm. Now they, uh, so let me, let me, go ahead, Dr. Brown. Yeah, and, and let me say this, and you've heard this, you know, on television, I'm sure. This, it's not proven that once you've had it, you can't get it again. In fact, there right. have cases where people have gotten it again. And in addition to that, they're predicting that this is going to uh, flare up again in a big way, coinciding with the flu season coming this September, which, which will go all the way to April of next year. So if you use up all your COVID-related benefits, that's, and, and, and it's not just about benefits, it's about safety. I feel what you're saying. I'm just saying that the guidance, and so this is a lot of people's, expert people's opinions. They're saying this is what we recommend to be the best way to handle employees. And again, depending on the type of employee, but everybody that we, are, that we have working is deemed an essential employee at this point. Okay. Yeah, I, I value all our employees. I, uh, that, that, our next, my next question is, um, with the state talking about probably opening, you know, in the future and stuff like that, what are you working on um, reference, you know, some of the limitations? I know we probably got to take baby steps as we open. Uh, it can be not be a, a full blown opening up. So, um, are you guys working on that? We we haven't seen the state guidelines on that. Uh, you know, if they're going to offer, uh, you know, some sort of a halfway or you know some partial way of opening, I, I have no idea yet what uh, Holcomb and his team have planned to offer us. They've not uh, released that. There's no at this point. There's no change in the in the stay at home uh, rule. And uh, the, I've not seen any guidance on that. And that's, so we, what we will have to do is adapt our environment to those, uh, to those rules. I don't think uh, Governor Holcomb will be as stringent as some governors that say you can't have rules that are more strict than the rules that the state has. I don't think he'll go that way, but he might. Nevertheless, I think here in the city, we, we do need to err in, on, ca on caution because 
I don't think we've tested enough. We're just hitting the 90 mark. And yet, Lake County is still um, one of the hot spots in the state. It's, it's Marion County. There's a couple of small counties that are a little bit heated up next to Marion County and then Lake County. And out of the areas, East Chicago, and, and, and in addition, we have had four deaths for, of residents related to COVID. One occurred this past weekend at the hospital, and that's the first official death COVID related um, in the city. There have been three other residents that died with COVID related illness, but they died outside the city of East Chicago. So we don't get that reported to the health department because we also, if you die within the city, the health department handles the death certificate. So we got our very first official co coronavirus infection uh, on a death certificate today. So that being said, we want to keep it as low as we can. So we do want to stop the spread. And social distancing and mitigation of the spread of this has helped a lot. It's been a, 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 a gradient going uphill to get to this point. And yet we still have people walking around without their masks, probably not hand sanitizing, you know, not wearing gloves if that's an option or something they have, but hand washing is, is important. You know, it, and I, I made this analogy, it's kind of like herding cats. You get two or three of them in the yard and then you go chase the others and by the time you come back, those three have slipped out. That's the way it is with people. People, this is America. People can do what they want to do, but it's difficult when you have a public health situation. Yeah. I opted not to close uh, the churches on Easter Sunday, but everybody knew that we had a 10 person rule. And yet some churches still gathered in there and then they had the nerve not to even wear a mask. If you're going to break the rule and have a whole bunch of people put on the doggone mask. And that didn't happen. So people do what they want to do. So the city is going to use the CDC guidance to guide the best health practices that we can. I don't get up in the morning. I've been a physician since 1982. I don't get up in the morning trying to figure out how not to help people. Yeah, you know, because uh, you mentioned the stats. I know yesterday, uh, 945 people in Indiana. That was the largest number of people infected. I think Sunday was eight something. So Indiana's not out the woods yet. And I'm trying to make sure. I rather err on caution. That's yeah, what I just want to do. Well, I, 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 I had a, a partial answer to one of the things that came up, if I can, for a quick second. So I found an article I read this weekend. Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb said routine care like dentist offices, abortion clinics, rheumatology offices, and veterinary clinics will be, will be reopened on April 27th. And uh, all the other policies regarding staying at home and stuff for essential activities are still going to be in place. So Indiana is not making any big changes right now. Just if you had a surgery, you're putting off, you can start scheduling those again, but that's the only real change to his policy for now. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Brown, my last thing is that uh, I'm going to ask the council, we could probably uh, have our, our, our attorney to write a letter of support of getting that um, testing center open. Um, that would be great. I wish we had more time because we're at the end of um, April. You're talking about May 4th or 5th? It, May 4th and 5th. 5th. Uh, I, yeah. So, I so what, what happens is if we have a good turnout, and I think that because the council represents the whole city in, in a geographic way, you know, you guys have a, a, a communication tree out there. You got to get people out. When we get the word that those are the actual dates, and that might be tomorrow, if not tonight, Dr. Box is up all times of the day and night, emailing and calling. But when we get that word, we need you to help get it out there. We're going to put it on all our websites and ECTV and all of that, but we need people to come out and get tested. 
That's yeah. how we'll know what's going on in our in the <clears throat> city. We'll know who's infected by this test, and then and then we're working on other types of tests. There's a uh, a, a saliva test, which costs money to get. Money to get. If they don't accept insurance, you have to pay $150. This test is 98% accurate, and you have to zoom and get on with a physician who walks you through getting the sample out of your mouth. And then you put it in the tube, package it up, and send it out, and then you'll get your results in in a couple of days. That's the next best test that I've been able to figure out that some people might have 150 bucks to get. Again, this is a good example of how people like us get, get the worst of everything. You know, uh, we, we can't afford the testing. It's expensive. You know, these tests that they've been doing they were originally priced out at around three thousand dollars or higher. Who can afford that? Yeah, yeah, uh, Doctor Browning, with that testing on the fourth and fifth, if they're only going to test you if you have symptoms, or it's going to test anybody. So here, here's the way it worked over when they had the site in Gary at St. Timothy's. I went over there, and they had a very poor turnout. Poor turnout. And so I. I said, well, look, you know, you're not doing a lot. Can I send some people over? And that's when we began to send people from East Chicago because it's, you know, it's not specific to Gary. It's just a testing site. You're an Indiana resident, you get tested. So they were a lot less, less strict about the uh, symptoms if when you went. So that may vary during this whole thing. If we got a lot of people that come out there, essential workers and healthcare people, uh, it's not likely that people who are living in nursing homes are gonna come to be tested, but they're probably amongst the highest risk group. But we know that we have senior citizens who live here and don't necessarily have cars to be in to um, do a drive up testing. So we've made some provisions with this test site to it, if, if we can get a senior citizen there, they can be tested in the general same area, but not necessarily because they're in a car. We, we're gonna have uh, properly distanced bleachers and um, you know, hopefully the weather won't be inclement, but we might be able to provide some tenting uh, for that and, and at least allow people to get tested if they don't own a car. If you don't have a car, you can't do a drive up test. Mm -hmm. And so I've taken that into account because we have a lot of seniors. The people who have died that are residents of this city have all been 70, 80s, and 90 year olds. Nobody yeah. un under the age of 75 so far of the four people who have died. So our seniors are at risk because they have all those chronic diseases. Yeah. That bring me my, to my bring next question. We got East Chicago Rehab and Canyon Men in the both senior buildings. Is there a way they could, they could go to the locations? That, that's another whole setup. And I'm, I'm all for uh, requesting that with, uh, from Dr. Box. It's a big state. We've got, so far they don't act like they've run out of tests, but I think the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So I'll ask. All she can tell me is no, and I don't think she's gonna say point blank no. But what I'm also hoping is, what they do is they set you up for a couple of days, they see how your turnout is, and then they try to extend it. So let's, let's come out, get our people out, and then where we see there's some additional need, then we lean on them again and have them put us back on the schedule. That would be perfect to be at a senior citizen uh, facility and do uh, testing. In a perfect world, that's what we should do. Uh, Attorney Buscemi. I'm here, Mr. President. How are you? Hey, can, 
I'm doing fine. Yeah, uh, after the meeting, can you get with Dr. Browning and you could drop up the letter to, uh, supporting his uh, his request for uh, testing? Sure, I'd be happy to prepare council? that letter on behalf. I'd be happy to prepare that letter on behalf of the council, Dr. Browning. What I would need from you is I would need whatever written documentation you have from the state health department that would identify exactly what they've said about bringing a testing site to East Chicago so that I can then uh, track the specific plan that they presented to you. Okay. And you could yeah. send that to my email, sir. Yeah, well, you have to give me that. Um, I could give it to you right now, sir. That would be my last I name, B-U-S-H-E-M-I at E C C letters for Baker Charlie Charlie at B C C Legal L E G A L dot com. Just send me the uh, the written it's communication. A, it's just an email. Yeah, e two emails. Okay, I, I can do that. Thank you, Doctor Dr. Brown. When are you going to know about the testing? Uh, again, I'm waiting. Um, there's a gentleman uh, by the name of David McCormick. He's one of the uh, site directors. And, you know, I think the, the, the issue is that, again, they have to move this, the whole team, all the equipment, the testing materials have to be where I think they're in Boone, Clark County right now. And so they've got to logistically get it all up here and have everything set. They've got some big signage. It's a, it's a big deal. And so um, I think that it's probably going to be the fourth and the fifth, but you know they haven't dropped the hammer a hundred percent. It's probably ninety some percent. So I, I I suspect that I'll know tomorrow. In which case, you know, we'll blast it out there for you, and we'll contact you and let you know that. Yeah, if you can let us know as soon as possible, we'll put the word out, and we'll have we'll have plenty of people there. Yeah. Um, Actually, um, President, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So uh, one question is, how? what's the um, number of people they'll be able to uh, take in on a daily basis? Do they know, um, do they have like a number of? No, I think that, uh, the, for example, the first week they did testing over in Gary and they were there uh, all five days, they only tested about 800 and some odd people, 820 maybe, and they decided to come back uh, two or three more days, which was last week. I don't know how many they tested at that time. They were out in Merrillville the week before, and they did still less than 1,000 people came and got tested. So just from that, those numbers alone tell you that people are not just lining up to be tested. You know, and that's, you know, a cultural thing in terms of people's unwillingness to get a, you know, it's not a needle, it's a, it's a nasal swab, it, you know, but people just don't want to do it. But then a lot of people did. But surprisingly, for all the thousands of people we have in our area, that's all they got out of the deal. Probably, you know, at the most, a couple of thousand. It might have shot over that. I don't know the final number. Right. And we got more people than that in the city. We should outdo all of those because if we do that, we'll have an idea about what's going on in the city in terms of this disease. This testing is, is, is mandatory for us to know really how, how much this disease has spread through the city. It's right. not if or ands or buts about it. We need to know. Right. So, um, a couple other things I wanted to add. One, um, obviously, when we do those large amount of testing, uh, we have to be prepared for our numbers to kind of go up. Go up. Uh, so we kind of, you know, don't want to panic, but make sure uh, we let everybody know, obviously, one of the reasons is for the large number of tests that's going to be going on. Um, that's one thing. But um, another thing, maybe we can speak with the schools to have them possibly do a robo call to the parents, letting them know that, you know, that testing is available and whatever other mass communication 
we have as a city to uh, get that communication out will be great. Yeah, I think we can uh, work with the superintendent. I think she's pledged every resource to help make this happen. And, you know, we said we want to use Central, no problem, whatever we need. So I think that that's a great idea about the robocalls. That's a great idea. Yes, uh, doctor, but as far as, like you said before, we, you still don't know what the, uh, you know, do you have to show yeah. symptoms or anybody can go? I mean, I, well, okay, so yeah, I, I didn't finish that. Tested. You know, you know, at this point, well, I know, well, and, and the second communication that I received from Dr. Box was reminding me what the very strict guidelines are for testing. So basically what that says is the person who has no symptoms doesn't get tested unless they're an essential worker, a healthcare worker, or they happen to reside in a nursing home. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, I it, it's, a, to it's a back. tough situation, but mm -hmm. people went to the Gary site. They got, some of them got turned down. They went around the block and got back in the line and went right through for different reasons. You know, these are people and they have enough tests, I think, to test the people that present to the testing site. And so they, you know, they might have turned you down this time, but people went back the next day and got tested. I don't know what they said. Some of them probably said, well, I've been coughing or I feel kind of warm. I don't know, but I would imagine people use their their ways to get right. tested. Okay, I can't, no, I, I can't say that officially. Okay, yeah, that I, I don't know. Question. I just hate to, you know, tell some tell all these people when they go there and to to get turned down. But well, no, well, here's 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 what I think. I'm gonna try to be on site for that, and if people come, we're gonna figure out the best way we can to get them tested. I'm gonna do everything within my power to get everybody who comes tested. Okay. I know there are rules, but just like when I went to the Gary site, they had three people in the line, and the guy told me, look, just send people, we'll test them. Then they got a crowd, and then they had to start discriminating again. Right. But then, for the most part, I think most people got tested because some people just went back the next day. But we don't necessarily have a whole week. They're just earmarking the first two days. I say we get so many people out there, they tell us they're going to be there the rest of the week. And uh, let's just do what we can to get as many people tested. Okay. I'm going to try to make that work. It, it, it's tough. This is the problem. It, East Chicago is not different than any other place that cannot afford to pay the minimum of $150 per citizen for them to get tested. You know, and and up. So if you got insurance, hey, your insurance might cover you at a at a private lab. All you need is a as is an order from a physician, and we are providing uh, orders for uh, employees from the city to go to different places if a, if an order is required for testing. But a lot of places are testing without prompting like that. Thank you. I have a question. Go ahead. I do. Um, Dr. Bronnie, how do you handle a situation if an employee has been exposed to the virus, they get tested, they're negative. Seven days later, you know, they get symptoms. So they're going back to get retested well, it depends because they don't advise that everybody who has some symptoms get tested. I think that's in a perfect world where you have lots of tests, they might change that advisory. So if you have what they call mild symptoms, you got a fever, you've got a cough, maybe a sore throat, you're not having respiratory difficulties, they advise you to quarantine at home drink plenty of liquids, eat what you can, and do symptomatic treatment. In other words, you know, if you got a cough, take some cough syrup. You got a fever, use Tylenol. 
So that's what the advisory so is. The advisory if you were tested, if you tested negative and you develop symptoms, if you're an employee, if you develop any kind of sick symptom, you have to stay at home. And in this environment, you're probably gonna be there for at least 14 days. Now we would probably give you the same advice because the guidance that we set up in the policy is clear. You refer to your private physician to let them direct you on what to do and what not to do for your symptoms. And if you if you if the if your physician says you need to be tested, they'll give you an order and send you to a private lab where you can be tested. So it, it doesn't change. If you're negative, come to work. If you develop symptoms down the road, because mm -hmm. I think we started this conversation saying there's no guarantee that you can't get reinfected. We don't know we that don't know yet. That. It's too early to tell. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Hearing none, Clerk, um, any communication from department heads? Yes. <clears throat> Accounts payable warrant 031020CC, 031820CC, 032320LA, 032320CC, 040720CC, 041320CC, 041320LA, 041720CC, 040820CC, 042720CC, and 042720LA. Is there a motion for these um, payable warrants? Second. Motion made by Councilman Hill, seconded by uh, Councilman Francisci. Any questions? Here are no questions. That. Roll call. Gonzalez. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Francisci? Yes. Hill? Yes. Winfield? Yes, but Councilman Hill didn't make that motion, did he? Make that motion. No. No, I didn't. Who, who made the motion? I did. Who was that? That's Kenny. Oh, Kenny. Kenny Monroe. Okay. Kenny Monroe made the motion. Okay. Um, Thank you, Stace. Okay. Winfield? Yes. Orange? Yes. Ransifer? Yes. Perez? Perez? Yes, I'm sorry, I was muted. Okay. Monroe? Yes. Garcia? No. Payroll warrant by weekly 030620. Zero three two zero two zero zero four zero three two zero zero four one seven two zero payroll warrant miscellaneous zero three two zero two zero and payroll warrant monthly zero four zero one two zero. Is there a motion on the floor? So move on the payroll warrant. Motion, motion made by Councilman Hill, second by Francisco, correct? Yes. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Francisco, you yeah. didn't say nothing, did you? <laughs> okay. Roll call. Gonzalez? Yes. Francisco? Yes. Hill? Yes. Winfield? Yes. Orange? Orange? Yes. Ransifer? Yes. Perez? Yes. Monroe? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Any uh, committee reports? There are no committee reports. Any board reports? 
Clerk, any read any ordinance on first reading? No. Any ordinance on second reading? Yes. Ordinance two zero dash two zero dash zero 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 three sponsor council members Terrence Hill, Robert Garcia, Kenneth Monroe, and Stacy Winfield. An ordinance yeah. An ordinance authorizing reimbursement to com common council members for reasonable education and travel expenses incurred for purposes of city related business or to attend conferences, educational seminars, or meetings related to city business. Is there a motion on the floor? Yes, Mr. President. I'd like to uh, make that motion on the second and third reading. Okay. Motion made by Hill, seconded by. Uh, Monroe, any questions? Yes, it's kind of woman orange. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I, I, as I've said this before, and uh, some of the newer council people won't, weren't on there, and you guys do the suit yourself. I think it's gonna come back to bite you where state board of council is gonna ask you to pay it back. This original, and I, I don't know, um, what and steve dalton was there when this came about you couldn't have a 1099 so state board of accounts wanted to do away with the twenty-four thousand. so you would only been making eighteen thousand dollars when they said you have to do away with the twenty-four thousand dollars the council people that were there at the time came up with the situation and say okay rather than to do away with the uh stipend for which we were helping people in our community and everything like that we will combine the travel the um promotional and education fund into that twenty four thousand dollars and the state board of council said okay you can uh do that you can no longer have the stipend and you guys are giving up the uh, travel and the uh promotional and um education fund i just say you guys just need to be careful we're making forty-two thousand dollars. We make more than any council people in the state. A lot of times, you can bring undue, unworn attention on yourself. They are already talking about in the state house of uh, the Republicans of reducing the council sizes in in, in Gary, East Chicago, and Hammond, and doing exactly what they did to the school board. I'm just saying, sometimes you can bring more attention to yourself. $3,000, if that $3,000 is going to make you or break you for going to an uh, 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 education thing or going uh, to, to learn something, then it, I, I'm sorry. But I'm just saying that at some point, I know you guys are going to probably pass it. You do this with yourself. And like I said, you can bring new things. Now, when they're talking about combining the second and third district, the fourth and fifth district, and eliminating two of the uh, council at large, for which they was going to bring this up, if indeed this COVID don't come up, you guys got to be careful. We make a lot of money compared to any other city. And I'm just saying that $3,000 to bring attention for them to go around and start trying to get rid of different council people. I'm just thinking that you guys need to leave this alone. But you do the such stuff. Any other questions? Any other comments? Yeah, I got a comment. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm looking at, I understand what you're saying, but I'm also looking at some um, people in the city making more than we are making. And they're getting paid, department heads, getting paid, uh, getting reimbursed or whatever, uh, to go on the same thing that we are asking for. So, I mean, I just keep on seeing how they can go on something and uh, get it paid and as a council to further our education and everything. Um, that 42000 they don't go but I'm still a fan. It's to be even possible. They don't get it, we don't get it. Council, Councilman Monroe, the thing of it is is that them people are doing stuff exactly for their job. You you do two council meetings a month, and I'm not saying that you may not work in your community doing the uh, thing, and I know that being a council person ain't an easy thing, but I'm just saying that to bring undue attention, because this is going to bring attention to yourself. You got, you're making 42, now you're going to add. It doesn't, look, doesn't say that that's for travel or whatever. Some of us may not never use it. 
I never used it. Right. Right. But like I said, at the end of the day, that's going to look in the papers and everywhere else. You're making 45000 out. That's a lot for a council person. I don't care what you're doing. But like I said, you guys do the suit yourself. I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm just telling you the way I feel. And I'm just saying that we need to be careful <coughs> because they always gunning for the Lake County uh, councils down here. And just like they did with the school board, everybody can get uh, taking people from their school board. But Hammond, uh, East Chicago and Gary D. So, like I said, but when you bring attention to yourself, this is what happens. But I'm done with that. Any other questions? Any other comments? Could be awesome in uh, Ransper. Yes. So my question is: um, Is that three thousand stipend going to be in addition to our current salary, or that's only in the event that we take those? Um, you know, her the education point. Yeah, let's see. Mr. President. I'd be happy to, Mr. President. Uh, Councilman, this is only in a re reimbursement situation. The money's been spent. It's been approved through a normal department head, in this case, the president of the council, and uh, being reimbursed. It's not a stipend. Any other questions? No other questions going once, going twice. Roll call. <clears throat> Sir, roll call. Gonzalez? Yes. Franciski? Yes. Hill? Yes. Winfield? Yes. Orange? No. Ransifer? Ransifer? No. Perez? Yes. Monroe? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Ordinance 20-0004, sponsor Mayor Anthony Copeland, an ordinance of the East Chicago Common Council concerning certain actions and proceedings with respect to the financing of certain Lakeshore Manor apartments. Is there a motion on the floor? So moved on second and third. Motion made for second and third. Is there a second? A second. Who seconded? Councilman Hill. All right. All right. I think we have somebody online here to um, talk about it. I think yeah, it's- Mr. President, is that Mr. Crawford and Mr. Burdick? Yes. Sir, do you want to go ahead and discuss the project and then I'll answer any questions about the financing aspects? Yeah, I can do that. Um, as, as you're aware, um, the project will be will, uh, contain 206 units of senior housing um, uh, located in two buildings uh, separated by Main Street. Uh, north of 136th Street, um, we're we're a long ways down the road. Um, all of the other funding sources have uh, have been validated. We're uh, we're in the uh, throes of uh, negotiations with HUD on the uh, final application uh, of the loan process, and uh, uh, thankfully with. Uh, Everything that's happened and, and the timing that, that transpired is still within our budget number. Um, uh, we haven't been able to cut any, haven't had to cut any corners. The project that was shared with you at the um, uh, last council meeting, uh, that is still the project that will be uh, developed there in East Chicago and, and again, I think just be a, a real monument to uh, the city. I'll take any specific questions that any of you may have regarding the project at this time. Monica, any questions, Monica? Ms. Guzman, any questions, Ms. Guzman? No, no questions. Lenny, Franciski. No, no questions. All right. Terry Hill. No, no questions. Judah. Stacy, No. Gilda, you got any questions? No. All right. Uh, Rancifer? No questions. 
Mr. Perez? No questions. Kenny, any questions, Kenny? No. All right, no questions here. Uh, what Mr. Crawford got? Yeah, just to reiterate, uh, the bonds uh, are not payable. Uh, they're not general obligations of the city of East Chicago are payable for many uh, revenues of the city. Uh, these bonds are only uh, being issued uh, in reality to get the state, uh, get the federal low income housing tax credits, which provides equity into the project. Uh, tax code requires that bonds be issued in at least 50% of the cost of the project to allow the state to give the credits to the project. And these bonds will only be outstanding until the project is placed in service. So that's approximately a year and a half. And then the permanent financing, uh, in addition to various soft loans, uh, will be uh, a uh, HUD loan. All right, any questions? Steve, you got any, uh, any input on it? I have been uh, given the chance to sit in on all the working calls over the last couple months. I have no additional questions, but I can assure you that this is not in any way a liability to the city of East Chicago. It's a potential positive, of course, when the project gets built, but there's no liability financially on the city of East Chicago. Thank you, Steve. Any, uh, any questions from any council members? Hearing none, roll call. Gonzalez? Yes. Francisco? Yes. Hill? Yes. Winfield? Yes. Orange? Yes. Rancifer? Yes. Perez? Yes. Monroe? Yes. <coughs> Garcia? Yes. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, any uh, ordinance on third reading? Yes. Ordinance 20-0002, sponsor Mayor Anthony Copeland, and ordinance vacating a public alley pursuant to Indiana Code 36-7-3. Is there a motion to pass it? So prove. Who is this, by Kenny or by Terry? That's, that's me, Terry. All right. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Councilman Hill, second by uh, Councilman Kenny Monroe. Any questions? There are no questions, roll call. Gonzalez? Yes. Francisco? Yes. Hill? Yes. Winfield? Yes. Orange? Yes. Rancifer? Yes. Perez? Yes. Monroe? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Any resolution? Yes. Resolution 20-0002, sponsor Councilman Lenny Francisco. The resolution a Go ahead, I'm sorry. Resolution of the Common Council of the City of East Chicago concerning a petition for use variance to permit a before and after school learning child care center on the resident property located at 5001 Indianapolis Boulevard, currently zoned R4. Is there a motion? Make a motion. Motion made by uh, Councilman Francisco. Is there a second? I second. Second by Terry Hill. Uh, is there anybody here to speak on this? It, real quick, Robert, uh, and just so you, just so my colleagues know, that's at uh, uh, it used to be a convenience store across the street from uh, uh, St. Stan's and the subway. Uh, kind of had some problems with it when it was a, a little grocery store, a lot of people hanging out. Uh, I, I think this will be a good project as far as for, you know, some child care for for uh, some of the residents of East Chicago, they can drop them off before they go to work and pick them up after. So I think it's more positive uh, than what it was before. Like I say, with that convenience store there, a lot of, uh, you know, just hanging out and, and loitering and, and stuff. So uh, I think this will be a plus. So I'm hoping you and my colleagues will uh, vote yes on the resolution. Mr. Morris Rose, are you on Mr. Morris Rose? 
Mr. President. Yes. Attorney Buscemi. Yes. Uh, a comment uh, for your benefit, for the benefit of Councilman Francisci and for the other members of the council. This is a use variance that would allow zoning and allow the operation of a new child care center within the city. The council may, in light of the times and in light of the fact that we're, the community is undergoing the worst public health pandemic in 100 years, the council may wish to add on this resolution and then also on the next one that's on the agenda 20-0003, uh, which is for a different use. That's for a uh, shelter. For this child care facility uh, use variance, you may wish to consider at your discretion adding an, a condition that the use is approved with the condition that when the child care center begins operating that it meets all centers for disease control guidelines. Is that well two things this is Carla I have uh, Richard Morris wrote on speakerphone he had trouble connecting so I don't know if uh, Mr. Morris or can you say something and see if they can hear you? Yes I, I think the, the conditions you're speaking of I presume the state licensing will be looking at those. However, there's no reason why the city can't also add those. The other is yeah. the only the the one condition that the city became aware of was the need for parking control at that corner. It's on the uh, recommendation that. We oh God. <laughs> I'm sorry, my phone went crazy. Let me call him back. I apologize. Yeah, let me. What are, they, they, did he tell you what uh, parking issues they have right there? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, okay. he's back on. Okay, there was a question about the parking. So on the on the recommendation that the the uh, findings of fact, we mentioned at the bottom that uh, parking from six in the morning to eight, there should be a strip of about thirty five foot that would be marked no parking because of the child care center. And that condition is included, Mr. President, members of the council, included within the resolution. Oh. Uh-huh. Okay. okay. I, I mentioned the uh, I mentioned the other idea just for the consideration of Councilman Francisci and the other members of the council. The resolution would approve a new use for the city and it would approve a new use now at a time when the community is undergoing the worst public health pandemic in the past one hundred years. And you, the council members at their discretion may wish to consider simply adding the condition that when the operation commences, that it be subject to CDC guidelines for child centers. There are published guidelines at the Centers for Disease Control for safe operation of child care centers. I, I, I agree with the suggestion. Anybody has a motion to add that in? I'll make a motion to add that again. Motion made by yes, Councilman Hill, count, uh, seconded by uh, Councilman Monroe. Any other questions? Reference to addition? Hearing none, roll call. Gonzalez? Yes. Francisci? Yes. Hill? Yes. Winfield? Yes. Orange? Yes. Rancifer? Rancifer? Yes. Perez? Yes. Monroe? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Any other questions on the on the resolution? Hearing no questions, roll call. 
Gonzalez? Yes. Francisco? Yes. Hill? Yes. Winfield? Yes. Orange? Yes. Ransifer? Yes. Perez? Yes. Monroe? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Resolution 20-0003, sponsor Councilman Terrence Hill, a resolution of the Common Council of the City of East Chicago concerning a petition for use variance to permit an emergency transitional shelter on the commercial property located at 1207-19 East Chicago Avenue, currently zone C2. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion made by Councilman Hero. Is there a second? Second. Who we'll made the second? Gilda. Okay. All right, Gilda. All right. Is there, any, is there anybody here to talk about it? Yeah, Mr. President, Marcus Martin was trying to zoom in, but uh, he, evidently he couldn't. And then I gave him also the, the password link but that we got from the uh, clerk's office. He, and it said it needed a password, but according to the form here, it said we did need a password. But uh, he would have been able to speak, but he couldn't get in. But I know that shelter is something that we have needed in the city of East Chicago for a long time. I think it'd be very beneficial. So I would like my colleagues to uh, approve this so we can have our first shelter that I know of here in the city of East Chicago. Um, any, any questions? I, I do. Yes. Mr. President. Yes, Stacey. Um, I was asking, asking uh, if we could table this. I actually, this came up in the planning commission, and my concern was that the location of the shelter. I would love a shelter in East Chicago because we need it. In my understanding, it's supposed to be a women, women and children. My concern is the location next to the bar that has been there for years. Um, it's a concern of the bar. It's on a state highway where you have trucks coming through. Uh, I have been people have I had several people uh, reach out to me concerning this. They did have a meeting. I, I think maybe one or two people came to that meeting. Uh, it wasn't a full board that was there at the meeting. It did pass, but there's residents that still concern. And because I think that's when the COVID virus had just started. So some of the residents thought that that meeting was canceled and therefore they didn't attend. Uh, I would like to um, table it so that the residents could come in and speak on it. I don't know what the urgency is on it, but that's a, a concern that I'm having right now dealing with that is the location of where it's at. And if we have any uh, other building, I don't know if this building was purchased or or what, however they got it, but it's just a big concern of mine. You want to make a motion? People speak. Mr. President, you want to make a motion? Uh, Stacy, you want to make a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion if we can table it. Morris Rowe is trying to answer oh. some stuff. Okay. Can you speak? Well, no, it's, a, it's, it's a motion. Hold on. There's a motion made on the floor. Is there a second? Uh, Kenny Monroe second the motion to table. Any questions? Yes. Yes, Gilda. Gilda. President. Okay, so President. I have been uh, working with Marcus Martin for some time. Uh, it's it's a situation where everybody says they really want a, a homeless shelter, but they really don't because everybody wants to be. It's not in my backyard. His funding is, is uh, and him purchasing of the building is dependent on this vote for us for this resolution. I think it is a good thing when he first tried to get it in on um, uh, Chicago Avenue down by the business. Nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted, but everybody want to they want to say that they are concerned about the uh, homeless population. Sometimes people say things, but then they're really not concerned about the homeless population. This is taking women and children off the street. Right now, I, we, I deal with North Township on, uh, as a case manager. There's no place that is taking kids and, and women together. They are se uh, wanna, they separate the families and the uh, kids uh, only up to a certain age. So if you've got an 18-year-old child, 
that is uh, in high school, they are separating that child from that parent. The thing of it is, is that I know that his uh, funding and uh, the purchase of the building, he had an anonymous donor that is helping him with this building. And so to delay it will cost him uh, funding for which I, I haven't seen anybody on the list uh, giving him any uh, funds. Uh, I know that the COVID came up, but this has been going on for a, a few years. Like I said, so all the people that said they wanted to help, uh, him and help him with uh, building as long as it wasn't in the downtown area. I think that if Councilman Hill, it is his council district, and I have been a strong believer that if it's in your district, you have the first choice of seeing what goes in there because after all, you're talking to the people. I don't think that people should should run over from one district to another to say what, what should be done. We have always had that honor among us on the council of saying what if it's going in your district and if you know that you have talked to your people, that it should be passed and, and no for the uh, table. Yes. Councilman uh, Francisco. Yeah, I just want to say the first time yeah, I did vote no against it because it, it was, it, and it wasn't even in my district as far as uh, where it was in our business district. But I am for this one. I, you know, not like I say, because of the homeless, they do need some help. I think it is a good location for where it's going to be at now. So, you know, my, my vote is yes for it. But I Councilman Hill? Yeah, Councilman I, I, understand Hill. What, I understand what Stacey's saying because it's next door to a tavern. However, maybe Marcus can put up one of those security fences around on that side that's coming all the way around so you, they won't be able to even look at the building. A six-foot fence, wooden fence, security fence should be suffice to handle that situation. So I'm all for it because we do need it. Any other questions? I have yes, one. Monica? So are you willing to put that stipulation in there? That that's, that there's a secure fence? Because well, this is the motion. I, yeah, this is the motion to um to table. To table. Can we table that to that stipulation be put in? Because I wasn't on the council when this came up before. Uh, my district is right next door to the third district. I mean, it's just a street over. So it was, I was approached, but if that stipulation can be put into that, uh, can we table it until the next meeting so that can be put into that? Because I know you can't do it right now. Um, you, you can do that right now. Well, my I'll question. First one, so you could. All right. Uh, my question is that. On this ordinance, it doesn't have nothing about the operation. That's why I have an issue with this ordinance. It's nothing about how it's going to be run, who's going to be there, security. Um, not too much. Just to, not, not at, at all how this is going to be ran and stuff like that. I'd rather have them come to the meeting, give us a uh, presentation like they've done before in the past. I believe Mr. President, Marcus is, is on wait. now. He's on? Yeah. yeah. I, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this opportunity for me to speak? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Council. Uh, thank you, uh, Council President uh, Garcia. Um, I just want to bring some facts up about this issue. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, that since 2013 has been dealing with East Chicago's homeless issue. We have brought in over $800,000 proven through our tax record that we have invested in dealing with this problem and also serving other citizens in East Chicago. We uh, not only have provided meals, food, clothing, uh, hygiene products for many citizens, not just the homeless, but also in dealing with this homeless situation. We're at the point now, this year with our property, which we have purchased, uh, we are now at $1.1 million that we've invested in dealing with this homeless uh, uh, situation without any funding coming from East Chicago. And the fact is that we, we're handling this problem. Number two, uh, just looking at, you know, just some real facts about the situation. 
I understand the concern about the safety of the people in, in, in the, uh, uh, the building and in the bar across the street. We understand that because we address that in the zoning uh, 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 planning uh, meeting. Those are all addressed and are uh, issues that are really um, not even related to what we're going to be doing. We're going to be uh, building restricted in terms of this is housing. This is a transitional, emergency transitional housing for single women with and without children. Meaning that we have programs in there to help women. We have programs set up where when they come in and they are in our program, we have, okay, what we're doing now, we're just carrying over from one office uh, 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 rented space in the Salvation Army. We're just expanding our service. We're already providing case management constantly, and we're connecting a lot of people with services. What we have not been able to do was help enough people in terms of emergency shelter and stability to be able to get the help they need because we cannot find any beds for them for some temporary relief. So having this opportunity now that we have gone to the investment of this building and making sure that we have a place where we can begin to, to work with our women. There's no excuse for East Chicago to have women out in dangerous situations. You don't hear the stories that we hear in working with our women. You don't hear about situations where our women are, are staying overnight in, in abandoned buildings and uh, getting sexually assaulted and it's never been reported to the uh, East Chicago police. But we hear these stories. We're rescuing women off of the streets. We've been doing this since 2013 and really uh, 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 helping out. Yes, it may go unnoticed, but we have our documentations and records. We work with East Chicago Housing Authority, East Chicago Park and Recreations. We work with the East Chicago court system because uh, uh, certainly Judge uh, Sonia Morris has been play, played a key role in helping us in dealing with some of the uh, uh, individuals in there who've had to transport across state lines. Understand, there aren't any beds available, but the homeless problem exists. It exists in every one of the districts that's being represented here today. I have photos. I have the stories. I have, we work with individuals who are sleeping in vehicles, garages, uh, in abandoned buildings in your district. I, get, I can take you one-on-one. -on -one. We can walk through those districts. I'll show you where people are. That's, this is East Chicago. We're supposed to be moving toward being a viable city that's attractive, that's bringing people in. Leaving the homeless on the streets is not a good way to make this a viable city. We have stepped in. We're bringing in the dollars. We're bringing in the resources. We're working with uh, uh, over 25 different partnerships that we're working to help change people's lives and move them forward and move them up. There's accountability. We're not, people are not gonna be out on the streets and kids running down through the parking lot in, in, in you know, Chicago Avenue. We have a boys and girls club for people when they get children when they get out of school. We have other uh, 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 things available. We have daycare services for kids. We cannot make this into it. We already operate on the Salvation Army. That's located on the highway also. The thing is that our, you know, we, we're going to run a safe program. We're going to have, a, we have staff now. We're going to expand that staff. We're under the city gate network or a, a national organization that works with uh, uh, rescue missions across the country. I've been a part of that in training uh, since 2013. We have security. We understand what security looks like. We've been traveling, trained in Houston, Texas, in their uh, uh, shelter down there in terms of you have to have staff. We're not going to open up and start operating until everything is in place. We're not going to run a haphazard type of a, a, a place over there. Now, another thing, during the zoning planning, people had the opportunity to speak out by telephone if they were worried about the coronavirus. And some people did call in, and some people, uh, I believe, I'm not mistaken, a person, uh, a correspondent, they had the opportunity to do that. We cannot let a political situation, this is, this is a battle in terms of the safety of people and women in this city, and there's no excuse. We've been working with them. We've been working with them. And now I think a decision has to be made that 
about whether we're going to have our women be safe. Are we going to be worried? You know, are we going to be concerned about some situation that really has nothing to do with what we're going to be doing? We can live peacefully with the bar. We understand there's glass all in the parking lot. You know, I'll talk with them. We'll work that out. You know, we know they've been in the community and they're established, so we'll, we'll honor that. And we'll work with them and things, you know, with the parking. We know they're parking on the property there. We can work, I think we can work those things out. But to say that we continually move when people say, well, not in my community. This is not located deep into a residential area. And also, again, I'm gonna go back to, our program format in there. We have space there. This was a dialysis center. We have space there where we can put beds, okay? And we can put a reasonable amount of number. We're looking at 50 square feet per bed. So we can set up 16 beds in the, in the uh, living quarters of that uh, facility. And we can, house, we can house people and work with them until they become stabilized to be able to move out of there independently and be able to contribute in a mature, positive, uh, uh, responsible way in, in to the community of East Chicago. Somebody has to work with them. It's the coronavirus pandemic going on. We still are working with individuals. We, we put all our protective uh, you know, uh, 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 equipment on and things, but all our volunteers are sheltered at home. We're not allowing our volunteers out, but we're still making sure people, we're keeping that connection. So we know what's going on in the city. And again, we've been doing this a long time. We know how to set up and work. We'll be certified uh, uh, operation through the city gate network where we have to meet certain standards and, and, and have to have certain standards in place as far as our staffing is concerned, as far as security is concerned. We're not, this is not new. We've been doing this. We just gonna expand it out now to where we have a place where we don't have to transport people to Chicago, Indianapolis, Aurora, Illinois, South Bend or Bloomington, Indiana. That's what we have to do because there aren't any beds here. And, and, and Hammond's pretty much filled every time we try to get, and that's only men over there. And then the women, we take over to Gary. And at some point, there's only so many bids available. And also they operate differently than what we're going to operate in terms of, we're going to work with people. We want to make sure that we're working with them. We have, we're going to have counselors and we're going to have partners with people are going to be coming into the uh, uh, facility and be able to work with the women there to be able to make sure Boys and Girls Club already set up. The young people that are in the uh, uh, housing, the, uh, the transitional housing we have there will go to the Boys and Girls Club after school so they will get the services there. The daycares, we're going to be utilizing everything we can to help women move out. But we cannot longer sit back and allow women to have to go and sleep in, uh, in, in, in homes of strangers who are waiting, especially when they have children, and set them up for failure, set them up where they're not getting the help that they need. We have on our record the number of people that we have helped uh, make it with the limited amount of dollars that we've had. It's critical. This is a historical decision here today. This is a very vital thing in this city that must happen and we cannot continue going on and on and waiting and waiting i cannot raise any dollars i cannot raise any dollars there if we don't have a building where people see now okay we gave you money we we, we donated money now okay you still don't have a building no more donation we have to have something to show that we are doing what we say we're going to do okay mr martin um yeah, I'm, I'm, when I look at this uh, resolution, there's nothing about how you're operating this center. You know what? Um, one of the motion was made just to table it. Um, would this be a problem with us tabling it? You get us some more information on how it's getting run and everything else. And that's all in the thing I that Councilman yeah, Winfield is table. I can give you the information. I'm not, you know, I mean, you're the council. At our next meeting, that. we can have, our, we can have an agenda at the next meeting. Um, you know, okay, well, I mean, if it has to be yeah, can I say Stacey. something real quick? Yeah. Well, no, Stacy, can I Councilman, say something? Uh, Winfield, please? Councilman Winfield, yes, yeah, you're, you're, you're muted. 
Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Since I made this, the the uh, the table, I wanted to say something because this get gotten blown all the way out of proportion. Uh, I am not against a woman's shelter, and I do know that this should have been happened some time ago, and now it falls upon us. I'm glad that Mr. Martin has come on here to do the presentation because I had not heard his presentation in the past, and my concern was for the bar. Not to say to take it from the neighborhood because my district is right next door, but I am a woman, and I do have children. So therefore, I think about women and children in their safety. And just like when um, uh, Councilwoman Gonzalez had even stated, well, can there be a fence put around the building? And that was before you even got on, Mr. Martin. Uh, I, I that was one of the suggestions. If we could add that to, the, uh, to your yeah. resolution. And so, like I said, I had not heard your presentation. I was going by what? I was confronted with, therefore, as far as people speaking, and it because of the COVID virus had just happened, I was not at the meeting. Of course, that's not my district, but it does exist right next door. So I am glad to hear what you're saying, but please don't make this as a political uh, movement because it's not. I needed to hear your presentation before I could. That's why I asked the table because I didn't see you down here to even do your presentation on this location. Yeah. So uh, therefore, it is an opportunity to go for, but that's the reason for my tabling because I didn't have the presentation and I did have concern of the location. But if we can't add the fencing to your resolution, which I'm pretty sure is probably no problem with you all. Um, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, yeah, uh, Stacy. Yeah, my input is that. Uh, yeah, in the resolution, I think it should state, you know, what it's going to be used for and everything else. Because it doesn't, it, it doesn't say too much in this resolution. Most of it is talking about just rezoning it and stuff like that, uh, but not too much about the operation. I'd rather have more. Well, the, the uh, go ahead. The reason I knew about it, what it was, is because it came up in the planning commission. So I did know that it was a woman, women's shelter with two children. So that's why my concern was the way it was as far as tabling. Can I say, you know, we're going to be a 24-hour uh, operation. Uh, we're going to have a system where people check in and uh, they will have the, uh, all the intake uh, procedures in place and registration that's required. And also, you know, we will have, um, we will have the services uh, that they're gonna need, that we're providing now, uh, we social service, we work uh, closely with regional health and uh, regional mental health, as well as North Township Trustee's Office. Uh, we've able to get a lot of services for people. So what we're doing is taking in uh, individuals who are in a homeless situation because anybody can become homeless. And once those women are in there, we're able to uh, go through uh, tracking with them. They'll be on a track and some of them will be on a 30 day track. Sometimes people only need to get up on their feet. They'll be back on their feet in 30 days. And then we have to make sure that some people that need a little lengthier time and have a little bit difficult situation that may require some uh, uh, financing or, or employment. We'll be have, we have all that in place to make sure that we connect them and we transport them to some of the things that they may be. We provide transportation for them. And then also uh, some people may need six months uh, to be in there and that's individuals who may have some trauma issues and need uh, some more extensive counseling and but while they're in the building they will be going through a series of classes and programming and also some training we will have computers set up for them and where they'll be able to do job searches as well as some uh, GED learning uh, uh, classes but uh, the, the, the critical thing is they'll have a place to sleep overnight. We'll be providing three meals a day for them. We'll be providing, uh, we'll make sure that they have the, the hygiene and the personal, uh, everything that they need to maintain a, a very viable, healthy place. But 
as far as the staffing is concerned, we will have individuals who are on staff who are trained and uh, we, there'll be our house parents who will monitor that. We have our program staff. So it'll, it'll at least be uh, four people on uh, uh, during the daytime on, uh, in the facility at all times. There'll be a restriction as far as going out and that's why we have a van available or we'll connect with the bus services. But we'll have a van available, uh, which we utilize now to make sure that people get to some of the services that are not there at the site. Or we'll have into, with our partners who come in, like regional health uh, comes in weekly to service people. But also we'll make sure that, uh, the you know, it's important that individuals are assisted in health. Uh, through a point system that we have to make sure that individuals are held accountable and they're moving forward, whether it's uh, counseling, whether it's employment, looking for employment. Uh, these are the things that we're doing now. And this is some of the successes that we're having now when we're able to place individuals into employment. We had, you know, over the years, 52 individuals who are now employed and the key thing is getting employed to have a substantial income to be able to be independent. We have a, a individual through the help of the city courts. We uh, with judge uh, uh, Morris. We have an individual who's in South Bend now who's doing very very well and who's maintained a very productive life because he was given a chance even though there's no shelters, but these are kind of numbers that we can reach and be able to help individuals move forward. Overnight security is very important that we have security overnight and security at all times. We have a, a, a volunteer system that we'll be using also for volunteer. A lot of people that want to come in and volunteer, but we want orientation and training. A lot of people out here with skills and experience and talents that we'll be able to utilize right there in terms of supporting the women. And we have the support system that's critical for them to move forward. But the staffing that will be present at all times, the security system on the door so that we know who's moving in and out, the cameras that we'll have, security cameras around the facility. But the main thing is we'll have life skill classes constantly, we we'll have uh, social services available to them. We'll make sure we have recovery classes for those who need the recovery classes. So we have a number of things based on uh, our seven year, uh, next month it'll be our seventh anniversary. And so we, we know we have a good target on what's needed in terms of helping turn some things around for our women. We just have not had the, we cannot do everything out of a one office space. Uh, we're losing uh, we're losing people on the streets right now because we don't have anything for them. The long delays are causing us to lose individuals and not have be able to move them uh, out of some un what we consider some unsafe situations. We, we we can't do it if we don't have a place, and we're losing in the meantime. Yeah, yeah Carla, can you do me a favor? Can you have um? Mr. Morris will write a bit, uh, another resolution because none of that information, all of that information is given us is not in this resolution. Like uh, a lot of other businesses, when they come before us to rezone, there's uh, certain uh, demands we put on for security and everything else, but everything's written in black and white. Can uh, Mr. Morris Mor Mor will come back and write that and give it to us for our next meeting? Okay. So I I think he can hear you. There's one quick thing I wanted to say. About half a dozen times a year in a slow year, there are people in, in the Walgreens or near the Walgreens that I stop and give information to. I refer them to Hammond and to Gary because they're homeless. They're in our town. If you just look who's it, who's hanging out there, you'll find them too. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's teenagers. Sometimes it's kid kids. Just last weekend, a young lady came up to me at the gas station, and I gave her the information for the place in Hammond because she was homeless, needed help. I never had ever seen anybody sleeping in that place by Calumet Supply, where Deodore and, and Columbus Drive meet. But I saw somebody a week ago laying on the ground with their blankets. I was out early in the morning one morning. Haven't seen it before. So, so this COVID thing is not making the homeless situation better. It's making it worse. In my experience, and I'm not looking for this stuff. I just live right here and I see what's happening. And if I see somebody in need, 
unless I'm in danger, immediate danger, I stop and ask what's their situation. I, and I didn't let the young lady use my phone because of the COVID thing, but I wrote down a number for her. I gave her a couple of dollars and I prayed that she went and did it. So this this is urgent. I certainly, Mr. Morrisworth can hear you. I ask him to do that, but just, you know, take it to consideration. I, this is, if you go out early no, tomorrow no. morning, you're going to find people on Columbus Drive who are homeless. I bet you you no. will. No, so, we're not disputing it, but I think just I was, like we do with any business, it has to be in black and white. This council has to do with due diligence. Um, any business that comes in to get rezoned, everything's down in black and white. Mr. Garcia. Yes. When, if I may, when we bring these board is only appeal matters to the common council. We do not a, we do not generally require business plans. Those can be you can ask them to return with those. You're simply being asked is this space which is zoned commercial may you have up to 13 women some with children two rooms would be with children and that's what you're being asked to consider. You can come back, and I'm sure that, that Marcus is most willing to come back and answer pro problems in terms of fencing, security, program. The facility that he has, it's only about a quarter of it that's being dedicated to, to homeless people. The rest is his offices and programs, the programs that are both for these people and for others in the community in need. Yeah, any other business that came before us and we had stipulations, it was written down in black and white. You can adopt the resolution hey, to make say it that. Differ. I you have not been given those in many of those situations. The, the, the small home that you have today for child care, you haven't rely on the, the, the fact of a state licensing mm -hmm. Commission when it comes to child care. There are a number. Don't look at everything when you're looking at a zoning matter. If you want to make the zoning matter deal with every issue, I look on that, frankly, as, as simply asking for more time, putting the matter off. Well, we know. I just want to, just for myself, get to organize. Yeah, just for myself, I'd rather have everything black and white. I don't think none of us has an issue, but I'd rather have everything down. What, Mr. President? Yes. I was gonna remove my uh, uh, table, but asking if, with it being removed, can that be entered in as far as fencing? Is that a problem? Can that be added, Carla? Uh, Mr. Martin. Yes. Yeah. Do you agree that uh, you'll add fencing to separate uh, that property from the bar that borders you to the, I guess that's to the east? Right. right. Yes. Yeah. If that's, that, yes. If that will uh, move this forward, uh, yes. Okay. I removed my table. I removed my table. Thank you. Well, I think, though, I said, that we should give him a time. Uh, this is Councilwoman Orange. Go ahead. A time mm -hmm. because. Uh, fencing is very expensive, and mm -hmm. so I think right. that we should give him a timetable, which we have done in many occasions when we have um, put together or given somebody um, uh, the zoning. We, we come back and say, well, you had six months to do this, or you have a year to do this, not immediately before he can open right. up. So I want to make sure that that state stipulation is on there, that he has some time to be right. able to do that. Fencing is very expensive. Well, especially in what's going on with the pandemic, so. Right. Yeah. But he has agreed to do it, though. Yes. Well, somebody, well who, who, let me see, who made the second? Who no. made the second on that motion? Kenny. Kenny. Kenny, Kenny, just, Kenny just took his back. Um, Stacy took it back. You want to make a motion, um, Stacy, for the fencing? Yes, I can make motion to add fencing to the uh resolution uh i'm not giving him a t well it's going to take some time due to the pandemic that's going on but if he can add some fencing for security right, a second. Is there a se gilda seconds it any questions on the 
An amendment. No questions. Roll call. Gonzalez. Yes. Franciski. Franciski. He on mute. <laughs> Oops. Sorry about that. Yes. Yes. Peel. Yes. Winfield. Yes. Orange. Absolutely. Ransifer. Yes. Perez. Yes. Monroe. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Okay, any discussion on the motion? On the resolution, excuse me. Yes. Mr. President. Yes, Attorney Buscemi. Uh, if the council members will look at the Board of Zoning Appeals findings of tax sheet, uh, and this goes to the issue that you raised about uh, specifying specific conditions for this area. There was a condition recommended by the BZA to the city council. And it reads as follows. The BZA recommends the condition that capacity of the facility be limited to 13 single women and two mothers with children. Correct. If the council wishes to pass the resolution tonight approving the use variant, uh, the council needs to decide whether they accept that condition that was sent by the BZA that the capacity be limited to 13 single women and two mothers with children. And then in addition to that condition recommended by the BZA, as I suggested for the council's consideration on the prior use variant for the child care facility, the you're approving this land use at a time of the greatest public health hazard in the last 100 years in our nation. And the Centers for Disease Control just on April 21, just a few days ago, passed new guidelines for the operation of homeless shelters, and the council may wish to also add, as part of its approval, uh, a third condition, which would be that the facility, when it begins operation, operates subject to and in compliance with the Centers for Disease Control guidelines for homeless shelters. I'll move that. I'll make a motion. To amend that. Uh, the president, you make the motion to amend that. Mm -hmm. Is the council president making a motion? I, I, yeah. Yeah. Attorney Buscemi, is there, is there a problem with me making uh, making a motion for that? Uh, it would be best, Mr. President, if you ask for a member of the body uh, to make that. I'll make the motion. I'll make a motion. Can you make the motion? Is there a second? I second it. Ms. Orange second it. Any questions? Yeah, no Mr. Questions, President, is that, motion, is that motion for both? Conditions, both the BZA condition of the capacity limit and then also the CDC operational guidelines? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. Roll call. Gonzalez? Yes. Francisco? Yes. Hill? Yes. Hill? Hill? Yes. Hill? Yes. O Orange? Yes. Ransifer? Yes. Ransifer? Okay. Perez? Yes. Monroe? Yes. Garcia? Yes. All right. Uh, any question on the regular motion to pass the resolution? Hearing no questions, roll call. Gonzalez? Yes. Francisco? Yes. Hill? Yes. Winfield? Yes. Orange? Yes. Transfer? Yes. Perez? Yes. Monroe? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Resolution 20-0004, sponsored Councilman Robert Garcia. 
a resolution of the Common Council of the City of East Chicago, Indiana, urging mayor, urging the mayor, city health officer, and all department heads to fully implement the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Corona Disease Detection and Prevention Technique of Identification, Isolation, and Thorough Contract Tracing for all cases of city employees testing positive for coronavirus. Is there a motion for a resolution? Moved by uh, Councilman Rowe. Is there a second? Is there a second? A second. Uh, Councilman Hill, second. Any questions on the matter? Yes. I have a, I have a question. Yes. Is, is this what was already covered in um, Council, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Carla's uh, address to the council today? I can answer that, Mr. President. Go ahead. Uh, Councilman Ransomer, it's not covered by what uh, was presented earlier. This is a different matter. This is a resolution that expresses the desire of the council to urge that there be full implementation of the Centers for Disease Control, Disease Detection and Prevention Techniques, uh, including testing and identification, including isolation, and including contact tracing for all cases pertaining to city employees that test positive for coronavirus. So this is a resolution that expresses the sentiment of the council, and therefore it is different from what was presented before, which was information about the current steps being taken. If I may, Dr. Browning, um, he went over a lot of things, but I think he's still on the call. He can address, I think, more of the council's concerns, but we've gone, I think, beyond what the CDC is recommending. And, uh, you know, we're providing for testing during work hours, the parts of the FFCRA that were optional for uh, employees who are local government that we've implemented. So, and we've been doing, we've been providing PPE, we've been taking these steps for a while. So I don't know if Dr. Brown can chime in. He's obviously the one with the most knowledge, but um, sure, that's, we that's great. Uh, all of the, the efforts that you're undertaking are great. All of the efforts that you're undertaking are great. And if you've went beyond what the CDC recommends for testing and identification for isolation of uh, confirmed cases and for thorough contact tracing, then as far as uh, Councilman Rancifer's uh, question, whether it's the same or different, if all those things are true, as I said earlier, there shouldn't be any problem with the city administration uh, accepting this resolution uh, that expresses the sense of the council. Can I, can I say something here? I don't know when the right time for me to speak. Go ahead, Mr. Browning. <laughs> Dr. Brown, excuse me. Um, I guess I, I, you know, I'm unfamiliar with this process of, of the council presenting a resolution. I don't know what the end result or the purpose of the resolution is. Uh, I understand the English, but the, as far as the health officer, that would be me. And, uh, I have followed the CDC guidelines in terms of recommending uh, um, best practices for the city to undertake for, uh, you know, for its employees. And then as far as what we're doing in the, in the health department, as I in detail explained to you earlier, we are in fact doing uh, contact tracing as set forth in the guidelines by the state of Indiana. The last thing I uh, uh, spoke on earlier in regards to employees, it's not an automatic that every employee lives in the city. I know the majority of the employees in the city do in fact live here, but they don't. I explained to you that if uh, an employee test positive and they, they perhaps live in Gary or Hammond or Munster or Merrillville, I don't know. 
they could be uh, tracked by another health department. So you're asking me uh, as the health officer to implement contact tracking tracing for all employees, and that's not the charge of the health department. Um, it would have been more prudent before this, and I, I don't like to use the word assert, I won't use allegation, but this assertion that we're not doing this to the maximum, how can you know that without having come to me in the health department? Had you done that, I could have sat down and showed you the data as I alluded to earlier. So it, it, it appears to me that you're asking for uh, a resolution on behalf of my, me, the health officer, and, and therefore by default the health department to do something that we're already doing what's mandated. Every employee uh, that tests positive, again, is obligated to show proof of that positive testing to HR, and then that information is forwarded to the health department. We're obligated by statute in the state of Indiana to report that information to the state because we don't track every employee if they don't all live in the city. So you, yeah, Dr. If, Brown, if, if, if this, part of your, part of your this, resolution is just incorrect in its assertion. Well, Dr. Brown, this is a, a resolution of the Common Council of East Chicago on my behalf. Um, so this has nothing to do with something on your direction, but it puts something in black and white as far as laws that's we're, you know, that's what this council does. Uh, but it's something that um, I think is needed. It's down in black and white. Um, and that's what this council is here to do, um, set laws and um, policy and forth. And, and, and I have no problem with that, except we're already doing those things and some. So to what effect does, does this come other than to imply to the public that we're doing less than what we're supposed to and uh, already take away uh, some of the confidence that the people need to be building? And I asked you, as I began speaking to you early this evening, to support what we're trying to do. We have a, a group of people that are positives, that are hanging up and walking away from the tracking system. Now they're gonna see a resolution that says the health department and the health officer isn't doing what it's supposed to do. If you're gonna support what we're doing, then support us, but don't break us down with one hand and then ask for us to do more. We're doing what we're supposed to do. We have a small health department with a small staff. Uh, I was remiss earlier, I wanted to introduce the new director, Diana Burns, who's on the call. I think she's on a, a, a voice call, and I believe she's still here. But, you I'm know, still we, here. I'm we're, still we're, try, we're, we're trying to be positive. I think that there is a, a, a negative connotation as if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Well, Dr. Browning, this resolution does not say nothing about the job uh, you're not doing. Nothing. That, this resolution does not state that. This is just stating that, hey, we're going to do our best to protect the employees of the city of Chicago. But this does not say you're not doing your job. I totally well, I, I think there's an implication that there's something that we're not doing. Oh, when, no. when in fact we're doing that, and then some of the implication, the statement, not just an implication, a statement says that we need to track all city employees, and that's not necessarily the job that the health department under the state of Indiana statute is empowered to do. And I explain those differences. So you need to be clear in your assertion. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other we questions? don't track all city employees. Yeah, the Human uh, Resources Dr. Department yeah. is, is, is obligated to, to begin to do contact uh, delineation. Myself as the health officer can help them with that, but there's not a proper tracking and, <laughs> and tracing process that goes on on behalf of the health department. We're not obligated to track any employee that becomes positive 
that lives outside the city. And that is the case in some situations. Yeah. No, my insertion was just contract tracing within employees I know, but it, it doesn't. It does not say that. It says all employees. Mm -hmm. Employees. Uh, Any other questions? Yes, I have. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Gilda. Uh, I don't really think that we need this resolution at this time. Uh, Dr. Browning has said his sentiments. They have hired uh, uh, Diane Garcia Burns, who all of us know and, and have uh, very a lot of confidence in. I think to allow her to get in with Dr. Browning, and Dr. Browning's been doing a good job, and get in together and continue to develop uh, what is needed to make sure. But this kind of resolution to get to the newspaper, like we're not doing the job or we don't care about uh, the people of the city of East Chicago, is just wrong. And I just think at this point, we, we need to leave this resolution alone. If it's something that comes up and we find out, actually all of us find out, not just one person, find out that they're not doing something, then we can uh, take it further. Resolution is not a law, it's just a recommendation. But still, I, I just don't want to see it look like nobody else has come up with anything in their cities to, to try to downgrade and, and belittle the uh, health officer and the mayor and all of this. If it's a personal thing, it's wrong. And so, like I said, I don't think we need it at this time. Yeah, somebody else had a comment? Stacy? Oh, well, hold on. Who's that, Kenny? Okay, uh, uh, clerk, can you put Kenny's name on that resolution? Stacy, go ahead. Okay. Stacy. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so what? I think that went through. Like one one uh, I think that Dr. Browning, with him answering all your questions, he gave us all his cell phone numbers. It was at a time that you called, that you couldn't get answers. And now he's reached out to all of us and gave us a number where you could actually contact him directly. With Diana Burns being the director, she's uh, used to this. She's experienced going through the COVID-19. So she is experienced in this pandemic and would be working along well with Dr. Brown and um, he gave us everything that we need to contact for him when you can contact him so that's what I need to say on that his behalf I'm more confident now knowing that we can call him and get information that you need and it, you don't have to go through a chain of command um, and I would appreciate it if you would come to the health department and we can sit and walk through, and I can show you what we do, we're doing. You can look at the NBS system on the computer and talk with the nurse about tracking. I've not had a council person to come to the health department, and, 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 and we, we take appointments. I mean, you just can't show up and, and, not, and I not be there, but this is something that we can allow. This is, there's a transparency here. There's nothing yes. to hide. Thank you. Right. Terry, you had a question, Terry? No, I like Dr. Browning. <laughs> Anybody, any other questions? Yeah, I got a question. This is Councilman yeah. Perez. Yes. Not so much a question, but a uh, statement. Um, on Saturday, where after reviewing my packet, I actually called Dr. Browning to be able and ascertain as to what it is that they do and don't do regarding uh, this resolution that was in my packet. And uh, Dr. Browning was very generous with his time and explained to me everything that they did, um, what they didn't do and why, the complications. We went back and forth for about, I don't know, maybe a half hour. Um, and um, I felt really comfortable that, um, you know, they're, they're doing everything that the CDC guidelines were already telling them to do. I did see a redundancy. I, 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 I don't ever want to uh, make a professional feel like they're not doing something that they're doing, especially the hardworking people of the health department. 
um, for whatever flaws we may have with, you know, employee shortages and things that, that we suffer from over there, I think that the ones that are there are giving it 150%. And and based on the and the fact that Diana Burns is hey Diana, what way to go? Um, <laughs> to me, that's that's a great hire, man. And uh, um, I am really uh, uh, pleased with uh, with that hire, and I was really satisfied and content. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Brownie, for giving yeah. me that time on a Saturday. Uh, you really didn't have to do that, but and I was appreciative that you returned my call and, and gave me that time. Um, and and I'll I'll you know I'll, I will I'll support your position that your your credentials don't get questioned or, or your integrity, or that you may uh, you know somehow feel that that this council feels you're not doing something. I I don't think that that's the case at all. Thank you. Any any questions? <clears throat> not here and I have never questioned his um, position or integrity I never said he did was not doing his job she wanted to make sure that the people know we're doing our job we got something in black and white but this has never been said that he ain't doing his job so just that statement any other questions uh, yeah I'll just I just a quick follow-up to that just in case you were referring that to me I didn't mean that you said that. I'm saying that the way he took it was that way. Yeah, no, he I'm talking about some other way. people. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I was not trying to, uh, you know, target you. I was just saying that I felt, you know, I feel bad that he feels that way. But uh, yeah. I didn't think that uh, um, that is the intention of the resolution. I, I, I don't believe that, that that's the intention. I just don't believe that it's necessary. No. No, Thank you. This this is a pandemic that uh, took all of us by surprise. Uh, Dr. Brown was before us in March. He uh, uh, and talked to us at the beginning of this thing. Uh, this ain't nothing against you, Dr. Brown, believe me. But us as uh, councilmen, we want to put some down in black and white to make sure everything's getting done. But you, you're doing an excellent job. Let me Any other say, questions? Let, let, let me just say this too. You know, this is a new medical situation, and, and you have to be deaf, dumb, and blind not to watch TV every day and figure out that mm -hmm. it's changing every time you turn your TV on and off. Mm -hmm. And so we've had to, to do cartwheels and backwards flip and change every time some guidance changes or they find out something else about this virus. And then, again, we're working with people. You tell people, put on your mask they don't put on their masks, and then they're exposed. This is a difficult situation, and I would challenge anybody, you help me figure it out how we can do this better. The thing that gets me is that the paper always wants to have this negative twist about what we're doing. This is not the wealthiest city in, in the world, but we got people who are working hard to do this stuff, and now, you know, we're going to have a resolution being introduced by the council to, to put a neg another negative bent. And you know, this will be in that paper. And I'm kind of frustrated about it because I work full time in a practice. And then I come to the city to try to give my expertise. I can offer knowledge, but you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it. So all I can do is give guidance. I'm not the implementer. So I'm just asking you to let your first effort at saying something about me that's probably going to hit the paper, let it be something positive and not negative. Talk about what we are doing, not what we're not doing. But that, yeah, Dr. Brown, this, this got nothing about negativity. This resolution has don't say nothing about negativity. It doesn't say you're not doing your job. But Dr. Well, Brown says you need to get with it all the way. You know, so you Im the implication is there's something we're not doing. I'm, I'm sorry you're taking it the wrong way. It's not meant like that. Any other questions? No other questions. Roll call. Gonzalez. No. Francisco. No. Hill. No. Winfield. 
Mm-hmm. Winfield, you on mute. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Winfield? No. No. Orange? No. Rancifer? No. Perez? No. Monroe? Yeah. Garcia? Yes. Any uh, more resolution? No resolutions? No. Oh, business? Um, Council President? Yes. Yeah. I would just like to say that, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Council uh, Woman Gonzalez. Uh, she made a meeting with uh, the Chief of Staff uh, in reference to the Health Department and them maybe not having as many staff uh, people as they needed. We said, and I explained to her at the meeting that we used to have meetings with department heads and uh, the mayor to try to figure some things out, some things we got, some things we didn't. But uh, after uh, Councilwoman Gonzalez, she expressed herself very well in that meeting. And I was proud of her. And we sit and talk. And I think, and I'm not going to say, maybe they already had it in the works, but I think that that uh, conversation that we had with the, uh, the chief of staff and the expression is, is the reason why we now have uh, uh, Diana. Uh, Diana Burns. Uh, I don't know if that to be so, because I don't want nobody to say that I, they may have said it was already in the works. But I, I'm just saying that conversations and us working together and especially during this pandemic it's going to be something that we're going to have to stick together because it's killing people and i know that they say i didn't have it but i swear that i thought i had it because of how sick i was but the, uh the thing of it is is that like i said it does work to walk across that aisle and talk to uh the uh, chief of staff or the mayor because i think that because uh councilwoman gonzalez expressed that we didn't have enough nurses so my understanding that um uh, Diana Burns is bringing on another nurse, and, and that's a good thing. So I, the conversations continue need to be had. Uh, we can all get over there. If somebody got a problem, we go in there together and talk and see if we can get some things done. But if, if we just continue to say we're going to beat it down, we're never going to get anything done. People ain't going to get back to work or they ain't get their days back and all of that. So I, I thank uh, Councilwoman Gonzalez for that effort. And like I said, and, and both of us was in that meeting. Any other uh, old business? Any new business? The only new business I got, I got Zoom. I had to purchase it. So anybody wants to have like a committee meeting, let me know. I'll let you um, use it to, for your committee meetings. So um, it is available. Any other? So new why business? did you have to purchase it? Uh, since our meeting is going to be longer than 40 minutes. Okay, so I would like to make a motion that we, that's something to me that we should be presenting as a payment. You should not have to pay for that because the, uh, it's over 40 minutes. That is not right. No, you should not have to do it, nor other, no other council person. This is a unique time. There's no way that uh, nobody should have to come out their pocket for no Zoom. And this is the only recourse that we have by the state that only that you cannot be together, got a social distance. So I'm making a motion. Uh, uh, Mr. Bashimi, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm making a motion that this uh, any bills for Zoom be uh, sent to the controller's office for payment. Well, uh, Councilwoman Orange, uh, that motion uh, certainly has all good intentions, but I don't believe it's necessary due to the fact that earlier in the meeting, you approved Ordinance 20 0003 that allows reimbursement for uh, the uh, expenses to the council members. But uh, if you wish to express that clearly to the controller that that expense be reimbursed, then uh, there's nothing wrong with your motion and the council members should consider it. And certainly it's a government, city government related expense as uh, Councilman Garcia described it, that he incurred and it should be reimbursed by uh, the controller. I think so too. And then as a possibility that maybe through uh, the state that we'd be able to get that money back and if they decide to do anything like that. But I don't think anybody should be having to pay for it. Right. right. Okay. 
If, they if, if I may, there's, there's a DLGF member that talks about local governments using Zoom for meetings. I'll forward that and make sure that Attorney Bashiri <clears throat> has it. You all have it because I think it's the, the state absolutely is going to approve that and not have any because they recommend that we use it. Right. I'll send you that because I can't remember all that that memo said, but I'll send it. Well, there's a motion on the floor. <laughs> is there a second? Second. second. Any questions on the motion? Here's no question. Roll call. Dallas? Yes. Franciski? Yes. Hill? Yeah. Yes. Winfield? Yes. Orange? Yes. Francifer? Yes. Perez? Yes. Monroe? Yeah. Garcia? Yes. Yeah. All right. Any other um, new business? Well, this is the first time for a, a computer, but public expression. I don't know if we have anybody on for public expression. Going once, going twice, gone. Well, if anybody's hearing, they can call in. You can write your questions in if you got any questions. Um, any other things? Not hearing none. Is there a motion to adjourn? I make the motion to adjourn. Uh, Council so President. Moving. Council President, this is Vivian. Yes, yes um, Vivian. The, the warrants that were approved today, um, can you have the council members to go to City Hall to Elita to sign them tomorrow? Did you guys hear that? Yes. yes. You got to go by Elida. Call Elida first to sign the warrants. But call her first before you go out. And okay. she have them done at the security office. Right. Okay. okay. Any, she, got anything? Kicked, she got kicked off, so she can't hear what's going on, but I'll text her and let her know. All right. Anything else, Elida? I mean, uh, Vivian? No, that was it. All right. There was a motion, and they got second to adjourn. Any questions? Roll call. Gonzalez? Yes. Francisco? Yes. Hill? Yes. Winfield? Yes. Orange? Yes. Rancifer? Yes. Perez? Yes. Monroe? Good job, Council. Yes. Yeah. Garcia? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you guys have a good night. Good yes, night. Sir. Thank, you, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Be safe. Okay.